Um, so my name is Anna Mathai, and thanks for inviting the League to make this presentation on the November ballot measures. So just give you a little bit of background on the League before we get started. Why doesn't this? Oops, I have to click on that. All right. Um, so the League of Women Voters, if you don't know, is a grassroots nonpartisan organization of women and men. And nonpartisan means we never support or oppose political candidates or parties. So we do have two branches. So I'm representing border service today, where we present, you know, we work to present complete information and arguments on both sides of the measure. The league also has an action and advocacy branch where we do take positions and we may, we may advocate for legislation or ballot measures, but that's not what I'm representing today. So just a few things on how to evaluate measures. I mean, you want to know, you know, what, what does the measure do and why? Why would it do that? You know, what does it cost? And if something costs, how is it going to be paid for? Is it well written or is it likely to cause more problems than it solves? Following the money is critical. And finally, you know, hopefully all that will help you come to which side you agree with. Do you agree with supporting it or you agree with or you prefer to oppose it? So voting is not a test, so it is really fine to leave blanks. Vote for what is clear and important to you. And we just wouldn't want you to not vote at all because something was not clear. So let's see what's on the ballot for this year. We've got 10 California propositions and we've got three Oakland measures. What is a proposition? A California proposition can make new laws. It can change existing laws and it can change the California Constitution. And the proposition passes and it becomes law if it receives more than 50% or a simple majority. Propositions get on the ballot in two ways. The state lawmakers, the legislature, can put them on the ballot with a two-thirds vote. And those are all the single-digit ones that you see, two, three, four, five, and six. While an initiative is a change proposed by citizens or a special interest group who collect enough voters to get on the enough voter signatures to get on the ballot. And so all the double-digit propositions are initiatives. So I forgot to mention as I got started. Um, feel free to pop any questions you want to in the chat or just hold them till the end. We'll just go through them and then I'll be happy to take all your questions. So let's start with the three propositions that are bonds or bond related. And so before that, let's just go over what a bond is. So to get money for projects such as, you know, building schools, bridges, so on and so forth, governments borrow money. They sell long term bonds to investors and then governments repay the investors with interest over 30 to 40 years. So the bond are paid back from the general fund. That's all our taxes and fees go into the general fund and that's where the bonds are paid back from. So again, let's start with the bonds. And the first one is a school bond. This is proposition two. So what's the background here? California has about 10,000 public schools and about 115 community colleges. The state and local districts share the cost of building, repairing, upgrading these schools. And both the state and local school districts cover their costs by issuing bonds. So over time, you will see state bonds for this. You may even see local bonds for this. And basically, that's uh, the state or the local government coming to voters to ask for approval to take on this bond debt. So this proposition is asking you to allow California to issue 10 billion in school bonds. And if it passes, the money obtained by selling these bonds will be distributed as matching funds to local school districts who apply for grants. Some background here. Nearly 40% of school students who attend schools in California, their schools don't meet the minimum facility standards, so they're really aging. And about 15% of students attend schools with extreme deficiencies like water damage, power failures, structural damage. You know, more recently, we've heard about lead in schools in Oakland. A little bit more background, the last school facility measure was approved in 2016 for 9 billion. So all that money has been committed and spent. 
We did have a bond measure in 2020, which narrowly failed. And that was the first time in actually California history that a school bond has failed to pass. So this bond is on the ballot now. And the 10 billion would be split up as 8.5 billion for public schools and 1.5 billion for community colleges. So what are the fiscal effects? Um, the bonds will be paid back with interest over time. And in the case of education bonds, it's about 35 years. So this will cost us 500 million a year, which will come out of the state's general fund. Another slide we typically have is this was is what we call the money slide. So this sort of tells you, just move this. This tells you um, who is supporting the measure and who is against the measure. So these dollar signs, so there's a total of 4.8 million as of this date being put to support the measure. Three dollars is a million and more and $2 in the hundreds of thousands and $1 would be the thousands. So you've got a few people on here with putting some heavy money into it. You've got some notable people down here who supported people and organizations who support it. And on the opposing side, there's no money against it. But if something is in bold, these are the folks who are actually signatories to the measure. So when you get your water guide, you'll actually see their names in it. So I will just give you about 30 seconds or so to look at this, and then we'll move on. All right. So the reasons to support and oppose. So supporters say, this is that it's crucial to fund basic school repairs to meet the safety standards and to support students. We point out that funds would be approved for local districts with community input. And this bond provides special support for small districts, those who may not be able to raise as much money themselves and those with disadvantaged communities. So opponents say, you know, school facilities upgrades should be done, but this should really come out of our general fund. They point out that California already has 109 billion in outstanding and unused bonds. And they point out the need to prioritize educational funding over other expenditures, you know, to make room to do this from our general fund. So, oops. Sorry about that. Um, so if you vote yes, you are approving $10 billion to fix a $10 billion bond to fix school facilities. And if you're voting no, you don't approve this bond. Going on to our next proposition, and again, we're going out of order just to do all the bonds first. This is also a bond, and this is around water and climate, right? So this is money that would be spent to improve the water supply and water quality, as well as storm management systems, water restoration projects, all about making, you know, drinking water safe for more Californians. In addition, there is money to be spent around climate mitigation. So this is wildfire prevention, response to sea level rise, you know, mitigation of other environmental problems that are associated with climate change. So the breakdown of the bond would be uh, 3.8 billion for water, um, 1.5 billion for wildfires, and then the other would include 1.2 billion for coastal resilience, 1.2 billion for biodiversity protection, 2.5 billion for clean parks, clean air, parks, heat mitigation, and agriculture. And 40% would be allocated to low income communities or those most impacted by environmental disasters or climate change. And some of this money will replace funds that were cut from the budget recently due to the current deficit. What is this going to cost us? So the fiscal effects, this bond will be paid back with interest over 40 years. And again, comes out of the general fund. So it's $400 million a year. However, just keep in mind that the bond would fund projects that could reduce future risk and the cost of damage from disasters. 
Again, if we look at the money slide, um, we have 3.4 million in support. We have no dollars spent against, and I will just give you again, maybe 10 or 15 seconds just to look through the supporters um, and opponents. All right, so reasons for and against. So supporters say that the threat from climate change is urgent and it's growing. We need to act now to make us more resilient. And they say again, these are, you know, this bond would make efficient and sensible investments in proven solutions. Opponents say clean drinking water and wildfire prevention are absolutely necessary, but again, they say they should be pointed, should be funded from the state government. And they claim that this could fund unproven technologies with little evidence of success. So again, your vote for is to support a $10 billion bond for projects around water and to reduce climate impacts and no is you don't want the state to issue this bond. Our next proposition is five and it's kind of bond adjacent because it's not a bond but it's about local bond approvals. So unlike statewide bonds, local bonds that are passed by cities or counties require a two-thirds or a 67 percent majority to pass and local bonds are repaid from property taxes. Prop 5, this proposition would lower the voting threshold on the local bonds to 55% from 67. Um, there's likely no effect on the state budget, but it could, include, it could increase local borrowing because there could be more bonds that are approved, you know, with the lower threshold, and those bonds could be used to increase local housing and infrastructure improvements. So again, if we look at the money slide, um, we have some money for a significant amount against, and I will just give you again a minute to just look at that. All right. So supporters say this gives local voters more autonomy to address local need that's you know so you should support it based on that and it could help build more housing that's badly needed the opponents say this is pushing infrastructure costs onto local government which is increasing debt we already have a very high cost of living and this proposition would make everything more expensive so again what your vote a yes vote means you are approving decreasing the voting requirement to 55% or the voting threshold to 55% for local bond measures, while you're voting no to keep the vote threshold at the two thirds level that it currently is. All right, so those were our three bond kind of bond related. Now we move on to the next proposition, which is prop three around marriage equality. So Prop 8 in 2008 added language to the California Constitution that says marriage is between a man and a woman. And Prop 8 was overturned by a federal court. It was ruled unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. So same-sex same marriage has been allowed in California for more than 10 years. And in 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court also allowed same-sex marriage throughout the U.S. So what does this prop do? If this prop passes, it doesn't change who can marry, but it repeals Prop 8 and it amends the California Constitution to include the right to marry as a fundamental right. Why might that be important? It's really future proofing. It's protecting from potential changes in the US courts and if they change their minds and decide to rule against same sex marriage. So Again, in terms of the money slide, who is supporting and opposing? I'll give you a few seconds to look over that. So 
So supporters say this amendment or this proposition would protect against future attempts to restrict marriage rights for same-sex or interracial couples and it would align the state constitution with current law and reaffirm the freedom to marry as a fundamental right. You know, opponents say as same-sex marriage is already legal, this amendment is fixing a non-existent problem and they claim it eliminates all rules for marriage, opening the door to child marriage, incest, and polygamy. So what your vote means is if you vote yes, the California Constitution will explicitly include the right to marry. And if you vote no, the Constitution will not be changed. It will stay the way it is. All right, so this is the last of the propositions that was put on uh, by the legislature, and this is Prop 6. So this is about forced labor in prisons. The California Constitution bans forced labor except as a punishment for a crime. So people in California prisons are required to work for minimal pay. And what this proposition would do was it would ban forced labor as a punishment for crime. So it would protect people in prison from being disciplined for refusing a work assignment, but it will allow voluntary work and credits or privileges for that work. And working could benefit the inmate to potentially reduce their sentence. And it could also change their current reimbursement for work from under a dollar an hour to the minimum wage. But this proposition does not require that the Department of Corrections pay the inmates minimum wage. So the costs are kind of hard to um, estimate because, um, you know, it depends on whether there is, you know, there could be an increase or a decrease in state and local criminal costs just based on how this is implemented. And kind of the worst case would be tens of millions of dollars a year. So in terms of who is supporting and opposing it, Again, you get to see uh, the supporters and opponents and the money put into this. And supporters are saying, you know, this would really restore human dignity by ending forced labor, which is essentially a form of slavery. And it would also support rehabilitation by allowing people in prison to choose their work assignments. And so it would improve public safety because there could be you know, um, kinds of jobs that they could do when they come out of prison. And there were no arguments submitted against the proposition. So now we move on to the propositions that have been put on by groups or interest groups or groups of voters, not by the legislature. And the first one is, oops, Sorry, I jumped ahead here. So Prop 6, uh, a yes vote, you support banning forced labor in prisons and the no vote, you support keeping things the way they are. All right, so now on to Prop 32, which is around the state minimum wage and raising the minimum wage. So the state minimum wage currently is $16. Some workers have a higher minimum wage, like fast food workers uh, and healthcare workers. And Oakland also has its higher, has its own higher minimum wage. And what the measure would do is it would raise the minimum wage to $18 for businesses with 26 or more workers starting 2025. And it would raise the minimum wage to $17 for employers with 25 or fewer employees by 2026 and then $18 the subsequent year. And then any cost of living adjustments would start a couple of years out. In terms of fiscal effects, it's kind of mixed. The Legislative Analyst Office estimates that it would increase the state and government costs because of you know, paying, um, paying higher wages for workers. However, there could also be uh, savings from lower enrollment in Medi-Cal and other social programs. So it's a little bit hard to estimate what the fiscal costs are. In terms of support and money going into and against the proposition, again, a significant of money for it from um, Joseph Sandberg mainly. Yeah. 
All right. So supporters say that higher wages could improve the standard of living for millions of workers and increased customer spending could also help boost the economy. Opponents say small businesses are more likely to suffer from the increased operating costs and this may result in layoffs of workers or prices increasing. And there's also the potential that reduced business profits could lower taxes collected. So what your vote means, if you're voting yes, you want to raise the minimum wage in California to $18. And if you are voting no, you want to keep the minimum wage where it is. Proposition 33, this is around rent control and someone earlier again mentioned flyers that she had already seen around it. Okay, so rent control limits how much landlords can raise rent every year. So many local cities like Oakland and then San Francisco, Berkeley have some rent control. However, there is a state law, which is Costa Hawkins, which limits the way in which the cities can legislate rent control. And it limits it in three ways. They cannot impose rent control on single family houses. Cities cannot impose rent control on newer apartments built after 1995. And rent control is for current tenants only Landlords can raise prices when they have or rents when they have new tenants moving in. So the effect of this proposition would be to repeal Costa Hawkins' state law and move the authority over rent control from the state to local governments. So only local governments would be able to decide if they want to regulate rent control for any type of housing. And again, they have the ability to decide they don't necessarily have to do it. It's just the ability to decide. The fiscal impact on local budgets, it would really depend on how many cities and counties pass these laws and what landlords do. Uh, the measure would likely reduce income from property taxes, which could be in the tens of millions. And cities or counties would probably also need to spend money to enforce the rent control laws. Uh, on the, there's probably little impact on the state budget. So again, looking at the amount of money, um, in support of it. So the AIDS Healthcare Foundation is a big player in the space. They've actually put this rent control on the ballot twice before in 2018 and 2020. And just keep them in mind because they will be relevant when we come to the next uh, ballot measure. So they are very much for it. And we have a number of the realtors, apartment associations against it. So supporters say that Prop 33 will allow local governments to protect renters. So, and they point out that local voters and cities should be able to decide if and when and how to regulate rents. While the opposition says that Prop, Prop 33 could increase housing costs, it could have block new affordable housing from being built. And if that happened, that would worsen the housing crisis. Opponents also say that this could reduce the home values. So you are voting, if you vote yes, you want to remove the current limits on rent control. And if you vote no, you want to keep the limits the way they are. Hmm. We are now moving on to Prop 34. This is one of the more complicated measures. I think some of the ones we've seen so far have been pretty straightforward. So bear with me here as we sort of walk through the threads. So there's a federal law. It's a federal drug discount program which allows healthcare providers that serve low income people to buy prescription drugs at a discount. So this is a federal program. Sell them at a retail and use their profits to expand services. So the AIDS Healthcare Foundation is one of these providers. As I said before, now for the third time, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation has used some of its profits, some of this money to place rent control, Prop 33, on the ballot. The California Apartment Association opposes rent control They've been spending a lot of money to fight these rent control initiatives 
and they want to limit the AIDS Foundation's ability to use its profits to bring these kinds of ballot initiatives forward. Right? Also, Medi-Cal provides health coverage for people with low incomes in California, and Medi-Cal Rx specifically covers prescription drugs. So what this proposition would do is it would codify the Medi-Cal Rx program into law and create new rules that single out the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, and more specifically, this rule that they would have to spend at least 98% of their net revenue on direct patient care. And so the fiscal effect probably is increased state costs to enforce these new rules. So now if you look at who is in support or the money in support and opposite, it's kind of flipped from Prop 33. You have the Apartment Association and Realtors on the left, and you have the AIDS Healthcare Foundation on the right. So supporters say that any profits from the discount drug programs should be spent directly on healthcare, and the state could negotiate lower medical prescription drug prices if this proposition passed. The opponents say this is an abuse of the initiative process to target one healthcare provider that supports rent control, and they point out that federal law allows profits from drug discounts to support any nonprofit mission of healthcare providers. So you are voting yes. If you vote yes, you want to restrict the spending of prescription drug revenues. And if you vote, if you vote no, you don't want to impose new restrictions. You're keeping things the way they are. Prop 35, and we're down to the last two state measures before we go on to the three Oakland ones. This, unfortunately, is another one of those complicated ones. So let's, let's talk about it. So this is around health care tax. So California charges health plans like Kaiser, Blue Cross, so on and so forth, a tax called managed care organizations tax. It's not permanent. It's periodically reapproved by the state and the feds. And it will expire in 2026 unless it's renewed. The federal government matches this MCO tax dollar for dollar. And that currently generates about seven to eight billion a year, which is used to support Medi-Cal. But lawmakers have used this tax money for other purposes in the state budget also. So what this proposition would do would it would make permanent the existing tax on health care pending federal approval. It would earmark or specify that this money can only be used to increase reimbursement payments for certain types of services, such as primary and specialty care. So it would prevent lawmakers from using this tax money for other purposes, or basically to plug hole in the budget in the, in the general fund or in the deficit. So the fiscal effects of this would be increased medical funding, but also increased state costs for expanding services under medical, especially if we get less federal match dollars. So if we look at the, the dollars for and against, and this is probably the most expensive uh, measure um, or one of the most expensive propositions on the ballot this year. Again, $3 signs is millions. So supporters say, you know, protecting and expanding access to healthcare for millions of Californians, including children, low-income families, seniors, and people with disabilities, that's really, really important to do because we want to protect and expand that. There is no organized opposition. However, Governor Newsom and policy experts argue that earmarking how the tax revenue is spent makes it very difficult to balance the state budget, and they argue for more budget flexibility. And they also point out that expanding medical services will create additional costs for the state, especially if we get re less reimbursement from the feds. 
So what your vote means is you want to make the existing tax permanent with new spending restrictions and a no vote is you want to continue as is. Our next proposition is Proposition 36 around increased crime penalties. And this is probably one you see a lot of ads and flyers for. So what's the background here? In 2014, Proposition 47 turned nonviolent crimes like drug possession and shoplifting into misdemeanors. Misdemeanors being less serious than felonies. Unless a person had prior convictions for serious crimes. So the result was the prison population decreased, money saved has been redirected to social programs. However, recently we've had an increase uh, during the pandemic and after in organized retail theft and smash and grab robberies. So the effect of this proposition is to reclassify theft of items of less than $950 from misdemeanors back to felonies if the suspect has two or more past convictions for certain theft, theft crimes, adding fentanyl to the list of hard drugs, which would increase, increase the penalty for its sale or use, and creating a new class of crime, which is treatment mandated felony. So that would give the offender the option to participate in drug and mental health treatment if they don't contest the charges, and, um, and if they finish the treatment, they go free, but if they don't finish the treatment, they could still face up to three years in prison. Um, the fiscal impacts, uh, the fiscal effects are hard to quantify. I mean, you, we could have increased state criminal justice costs, costs from, you know, if we result, if we have an increase in prison population and an increase in court work, court workload. So that could be both state costs increasing and local criminal justice cost increasing. And Prop 37 would also reduce the state savings that we had from Prop 47 that are currently used for mental health, drug treatment, and some school programs and, vict and victim services. So if we look at the support and against, um, you will pretty much this speaks for itself. So supporters say that tougher laws against retail thefts will protect businesses in every community, and it will reduce crime and substance abuse by mandating treatment for felony drug offenders. Opponents say this makes California less safe by reducing funding for crime prevention treatment, rehabilitation, and services for crime victims, and it could cost taxpayers billions to improve, imprison more people without reducing crime. So you are voting yes if you want to increase the penalties on some crimes, or you're voting no to keep things the way they are. Moving on to the Oakland ballot measures, how do things get on the Oakland ballot? Um, the city council can place a measure on the ballot and that's two of them, that's measure MM and OO, or citizens and groups can place an initiative and that's measure NM. So let's start with measure MM. This is around wildfire prevention. So the Oakland Hills require active management of high wildfire risks and voters in the hills have previously voted to fund fire prevention efforts. This year, Oakland adopted a 10-year vegetation management plan to manage these fire risks. And what this measure would do is it would impose a special tax for 20 years on owners of properties within the wildfire prevention zone. So this is a high fire risk zone as defined by the California Department of Forestry and Wildfire Prevention. And this money would be used to implement the city's vegetation management plan. So managing dead drying trees, managing evacuation routes, and so on. So most importantly, keep in mind that only voters in this wildfire prevention zone will see this measure. So if you don't live within this zone, 
and you see the red lines kind of in the map here. And we have a map that you can download from our website that really blows this up. So if you don't live within the zone, you are not going to see this measure, you are not voting on it. But if you do, your fiscal effects would be an annual parcel tax. So property, people with properties in this wildfire prevention zone will be an additional $99 for single family dwelling, $65 for each unit in residential, multi-unit residential properties for 20 years. There would be exemptions for low-income seniors, some other exemptions apply, and this money would raise about $2.7 million starting the middle of next year, which would be the first year. For local measures, we typically don't have a lot of money that's raised. So you see, what you see in bold here are the signatories. So that's something that we typically report and they are again in your voter booklet. So, Supporters say the most effective way to prevent forest fires is preventative. And so this money is needed to fund the implementation of Oakland's comprehensive vegetation management plan. Opponents say, you know, wildfire prevention is essential, but they argue that this should be funded out of the city's general fund. And they are also unhappy about the oversight being inadequate because an audit by the city auditor is optional. So if you are a voter who lives or who owns property within this wildfire zone, a vote yes would support a special tax for wildfire prevention, and a vote no would oppose the special tax. All right, going into measure NN, which is around violence prevention. So since 2014, under Measure Z, Oakland has collected both property and parking lot taxes to fund violence prevention and emergency response programs. So this Measure Z funds the Oakland, partly funds Oakland Police Department, the Department of Violence Prevention, and Oakland Fire Department. So we, Measure Z raises about $30 million a year, and it's going to expire at the end of 2024. So what Measure NN would do is it would continue and it would increase the current parcel and parking lot taxes for nine more years. And the money would be spent on reducing homicides, robberies, carjacking, other violence, improving 911 emergency call response rates and reducing human trafficking. So the money would be about 60% to OPD, 40% to the Department of Violent Prevention, 3 million off the top to the fire department. And the Department of Violent Prevention would be required to spend 75% of its revenue for providing grants to community-based organizations. So what does this mean in terms of numbers? A, the parcel tax on a single family unit would increase from $133 to $198 a year. Multi-units would go from $97 to $132 per unit. Um, the parking surcharge on commercial lots would go from 8.5 to 10%. You have annual increases, and again, you have exemptions for seniors with low incomes, people living in affordable housing projects, and you have some other exemptions. And the auditor estimates that the first year of revenue would be about $47 million. Um, again, usually there's not a lot of money that's put towards local measures. Um, there's been a lot of concern in Oakland about you know, a lot of, lot of these issues. And so you can see the supporters and those against. So supporters say this would enhance public safety by funding critical violence prevention programs. And it would pay for the police and firefighters that Oakland needs and provide resources to improve 911. Opponents say, you know, Measure Z taxes have not prevented violence, so why should the measure be extended? And then they also argue that not enough of these funds would go directly into supporting the hiring of police officers. 
So your yes vote is support you support extending and increasing this parcel tax for nine more years, and a no vote is you oppose extending this tax. All right, we are down to measure OO, which is the third and the last of the Oakland measures, and this is around the Public Ethics Commission. So in 1996, voters approved the Public Ethics Commission, which has seven volunteer commissioners. The commission ensures compliance with Oakland's government ethics, campaign finance, transparency, and lobbyist registration laws. They are supported by a small department of city staff members and then the seven volunteer commissioners. In 2014, the commission was given some additional authority and its staffing was increased a bit. But the situation right now is the investigative workload has increased significantly to exceed its staffing capacity to the extent that half of the commission's investigative workload is on hold. So the effect of this measure would be to update the governance and quorum rules and staffing classifications to basically streamline the commission operation, adding resources in the form of one ethics investigator um, and lowering the maximum gift limit that anyone can gift to an elected city office holder, a candidate or a member of their immediate family to $50. So the fiscal effects are around a couple of hundred thousand. Um, the additional investigator effective a couple of years from now would cost about this amount. And then there's some change in classifications which could increase or decrease the cost. So you're basically looking at something on this order. In terms of, again, no money for or against it. Um, and this, these are the signatories. So supporters say in order to be effective, the commission must have resources to manage its workload and you really want to limit gifts from lobbyists to public officials and candidates. That's really a good thing to do. Opponents say, you know, Voters should not approve any additional funding for the Public Ethics Committee because Commission because it's not always done its job of holding public officials accountable or of ensuring that government processes are transparent. So a yes vote is you are approving these charter amendments to the Public yes. Ethics Commission and a no vote is you are opposing those. So I have a few more slides just before I close out. Candidate forums, while we never endorse or oppose candidates, we do conduct candidate forums, and those are linked off our website. We actually have a second set of candidate forums coming up on October 5th. We had our first set of eight on the 21st, and we have recordings, and we have our second set coming up on the 5th, and there are four forums on that day. Something else that we have this time, which we don't typically have, is two recall elections. So there's the recall election for the mayor, where you're deciding whether or not to recall Mayor Sheng Tao. If you vote yes, you are voting that she be removed from office now. If you vote no, you're voting that she be allowed to finish her term, which goes through January 2027. And the recall requires a simple majority of 50. A little bit more, if the recall passes, the president of the city council takes over temp as a temporary mayor. The current president is Nikki Vass, who is a city council member for District 2. And then just, they would take over temporarily, and then we would have a special election in early 2025. And that new mayor's term, if that comes to pass, would last till January 2027. So they would complete the current term. The DA recall, so again, Alameda County voters are deciding whether to recall uh, District Attorney Pamela Price. And if that passes, the Alameda County Board of Supervisors will appoint a new DA who will serve out the term till the next general election in 2026. Something again that's different this time is the youth vote. So we passed a measure in 2020, which made 16 and 17 year olds eligible to vote in OUSD school board elections. And this year, 
uh, the technology is finally in place to implement it. So any 16 or 17 year old residing in Oakland who has previously pre-registered to vote will automatically be pre-registered to vote in this only in this Oakland school board election. Just a reminder is always ranked choice voting is how we vote on our all on on all Oakland races. So you get up to five choices. You don't have to use them all. And again, you want to just use as many candidates as you would want to have in that position. So you start with your favorite, you know, and move down, move, start with first choice, second choice, keep going till there's somebody you really don't want to vote for. And just all the basics, you know, don't don't fill out multiple bubbles in the same column or that will invalidate your ballot. Don't fill out you know, the same for the same candidate five times because that's not going to do any of them any good. A um, couple of other things. This is a lot of information to go through. So just a reminder that this is just a starting point. We have for the local measures, we have one page descriptions. We also have short videos under two minutes each on our website and we have a link to the state measures. And finally, we are very excited to be celebrating our centennial this year, which is 100 years of championing democracy. So you've got our website here. Um, Vote 411 is our national platform. And if you go there and you enter your address, you'll see your entire ballot and also link to voting resources. And finally, you know, do consider becoming a member. We offer a sliding scale fee to support all budgets. But most importantly, it's the validation of the work that we do. So I am going to stop sharing at that point and open it up for questions. We have a couple of questions already in the chat. The first from Sydney Ritchie, who says, um, how can I get the league to do a presentation um, for, for her office? So um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about the process if anyone wants a similar present or wants to invite you to, to do this or version of this? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I could put my email into chat here and I'll just do that shortly. So you can just reach out to me. I'm happy to do it. And again, we ask that we ask just in terms of um, efficiencies. We ask that you have a group of at least 15 because we do have a lot of requests and we just want to be sure that um, you know, we make the most efficient use of our volunteers and our time, but happy to do that. Great, and then um, looks like Trina had asked, um, so going back to the minimum wage, um, so 32, I guess, um, is, no, I'm sorry, wrong question. That was Marcus's question, which I already answered. So the minimum wage question, so your question was more about the, the labor uh, in prison question, which is, and I think you answered this, but will Prop 6 ensure minimum wage for workers and who are incarcerated? It does not. So it it so it's basically banning forced labor, but it does not. It is up to the Department of Corrections to decide the wage. It, the proposition does not mandate that inmates have to be paid minimum wage. And just to go back to the minimum wage for just I, and I may, may have rushed through this, the minimum wage for California is $16 uh, dollars an hour. However, currently Oakland minimum wage. So whenever you have like state and city, whichever is higher trumps. So Oakland minimum wage is 1650 across the board for all roles. And it's a little bit higher for larger hotels workers it's a little complicated so workers who uh, work in larger hotels um so i think for across so this would help this measure probably would not help if you work in a hotel in oakland chances are your current wage is higher than what this new state minimum wage would bring in but if you're working in any other job um, as Oakland is 1650 currently, you know, with, with cost of living adjustments, and this is mandating 17 or $18, you're likely to get a slight bump um, if this proposition passes. Mm. Uh, yep. Sorry, does, Marcus. Does, does that, um, does that, like, uh, 
take effect even if you're working outside of the zone that you live in? Because, so like, I'm thinking back in in uh, when I worked at C CVS in El Cerrito, but I lived over here. No, so the so the wages the wages is is mandated by the city that you're working in. It doesn't matter where you live. It's the the employer where you the city in which you are working mandates the wage. So if you live in Oakland but you work you work in El Cerrito, you are governed by El Cerrito's law. Oakland <laughs> is not the Oakland minimum wage is not going to help you, unfortunately. Yeah. Does this apply to tipped workers as well? That's actually a good question. I don't believe, and I will, I don't believe, I'm sorry, I'm going to restrict this to Oakland. Oakland, the, the Oakland minimum, we, Oakland does not allow a tipped wage. I know that Oak, the Oakland 1650 is a mandated minimum wage for anybody who works more than two hours a week. Oakland does not allow a minimum wage based on, you know, like $2 or something and saying you make the rest up with tips. Tips are over and above what you get in the minimum wage. Um, the rest of California, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure, yeah. So tipped workers should be getting 1650 as well? Absolutely. Okay, I'll have to discuss it with them. Thank yeah, and actually there are, um, yeah, absolutely. And there are and then, actually on the city of Oakland, if you think of an employer is not doing this, there are actually posters that the city of Oakland puts out every year specifying what the rate is because January, January of every year with the cost of living adjustment, you know, the number goes up. So Oakland puts out a poster every year. So yeah, feel free to print those off and hand them around if someone's not get not being paid that. Okay, thank I, you. I just did a quick Google search. It looks like Berkeley and San Francisco are worth at 1807 for tipped employees. So. So those were the only questions in the chat. Any others? Anyone wants to ask? Well, not about voting or anything. Other kind of questions. We have one question here. So um, um, Chrysantha says on, um, on Proposition 35, the health care tax becoming permanent and preventing lawmakers using funds for other things, why would this reduce the federal matched amount? Is the question. Yeah, I, I don't think it's specifically because of Prop 35, but there is some controversy around this managed care fund and whether California is gaming the system. So the feds, there's some discussion from the feds as to whether they should really be matching what we are doing. And so that is the concern that the opponents have of Prop 35. It's this proposition is written based on some assumptions, the kind of money we're getting from the feds today. But if that changes and they decide to give us less money, are we going to be on the hook for additional services? Where will that money come from? That really is the concern if that helps. Thank you. All right. Last call for any questions. And I thank you so much um, for your time. Um, pleasure as always. It's a uh, I know I have a page of notes and I'm looking forward to voting um, as a much more informed voter than I would be trying to read through everything myself. So thank you again. Um, pleasure having you. Hopefully we, we will see you again for the next election cycle. Um, but, um, you know, thank you again for your time and and to the League of Women Voters for making this uh, this free service available to our to our neighborhood. Absolutely. No, happy to. Thank you. Please go out and vote early and often. Yeah.